It's the worst of all economic scenarios. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, the U.S. manufacturing sector is now flashing signs of stagflation, which is one of the worst scenarios. When you look at it from a consumer standpoint that are already dealing with higher prices, now we're going to face the likely chance of increasing layoffs. And as we look forward to the Fed meeting on Wednesday, where they're largely expected to raise rates, this is also a horrible situation for them because they cannot deal with both the fact that the the economy is slowing down at a time when inflation remains high. And is the dollar likely to crash? Well, if you're bullish on gold, and I know many of you are, we're going to make the case of why the dollar is about to plummet. And did the government give JP Morgan a huge gift? Well, this is one that we're even shocked that they did. Let's head over to Zero Hedge where we pick today's story up with a headline, ISM manufacturing screams stagflation still contracting with reigniting inflationary pressures. And again, this is the worst possible scenario because you have a period of slowing growth where you have high prices. And of course, it's the high prices that we know are leading to the slower growth because wages aren't keeping up with inflation. And then at that time, we see demand fall. And as demand falls, well, layoffs increase. Here we can see from S&P Global, the U.S. Manufacturing Final Purchasing Managers Index print down to 50.2 from the flash scenario, which was a preliminary data 50.4, but notably it's up from 49.2 in March. So what is this telling us is the manufacturing sector is flatlined. It's not growing, it's not contracting, it's pretty much hovering even, it's not moving at all. And this is a dangerous sign now because we need to see a boost of economic growth to pull not only the US, but the global economy higher as it faces this issue with higher higher interest rates. And here we can see from the quote unquote official ISM manufacturing PMI, if you're wondering why we're saying in quotes is because, well, there is no official PMI report issued by the government. We're seeing now it contract to 47.1. So again, this is a slight contraction, but look at what we see just in the headline, new orders and production contracting. So what are we looking for here? Our signs, the economy slowing, we're looking for unemployment rising, and we're looking for higher prices. So we see on the onset, that yes, the economy is indeed slowing down. Here we see prices increasing when we really need to see them heading lower. And how about this from a global demand perspective? And this is dangerous. We're gonna dig deeper into the global economy and show why the stagflation issue is not just localized. Look at this, exports and imports both contracting. And we'll look at some of the respondents because some of these are good, but a lot of them look pretty bad. Here we can see looking to reset with a number of our suppliers to reduce inventory that's not bullish business continues to contract pricing pressures continue to plague daily operations customers seem quite heavy on inventory sales continue to be soft so what do you see there is inventories are not being drawn down inflation is still a problem and so what we have is issues here and that leads of course to eventual layoffs as we'll make the case here as a moment let's dig deeper into the report here we can see that new orders are slowing. This would make sense if the economy is slowing. Employment is flatlined. Now, you might be wondering, why is employment flatlining at 50.2? Because employers have gone out, they've hired people, they've trained them, they're hanging on as long as they can because they don't want to go through a big round of layoffs if the economy rebounds and then have to hire them back. So they're going to stretch this out as long as possible. But, of course, what we've noted is particularly in the tech space over the last several weeks is that second round of layoffs coming. I mean, it's eventually going to get to the manufacturing sector. I'm going to show you why. It's not just because prices are now turning back up now. This is increasing from a decreasing standpoint. That is a red flag. But look at this backlog of orders. So you think about this. You've got a whole bunch of workers, and you see this backlog of orders at 43.1. What that tells you is there's a contraction. You're working down that backlog. Well, at some point, if your new order demand falls and you run through your backlog, guess what you have a whole bunch of? You got it, idle employees, and eventually some of them go. 
Here we can see new export and import orders. They're flatlining, and that is, again, not a good sign. So as we look at unfilled orders, that backlog, and we'll put that up against the four-week moving average of initial claims. We'll show that in red. And you can see as the backlog of orders gets worked through, we can see this throughout history. As the blue line goes down, what happens is the red line or initial claims heads higher because, again, if you don't have work for people, well, you don't need them on the payroll, especially during times of high inflation. And what about that price is paid component? Well, this is the Philly Fed diffusion index, as was the last one that was that one was unfilled orders. This one is prices paid. Now we're not seeing prices paid move up on the Philly, but we're seeing it move up on the ISM. The question we're going to look at is if indeed the Philly Fed showed an increase in prices paid, should we see a with a lag if follow the CPI? And the answer is well, yes, we tend to see that. Here you can see it in the mid 80s, prices paid head higher. And again, with a lag, which we expect every time the CPA, CPI falls higher, we see it repeatedly happening. So this is a sign of potentially that inflation is coming back. And it's a global issue. China factory activity unexpectedly cools in April. Of course, you're wondering why unexpectedly is because everybody pinned the rebound of the global economy on China. But wait till you see these next several sets of data. It tells you that whatever's going on in China, perhaps a proxy now of what's going on in the world economy is absolutely terrible. The official manufacturing purchases manager index declined to 49.2, again, showing stagnation in the Chinese manufacturing sector. Again, 50 is unchanged from 51.9 in March. Let's continue and look deeper here. New export orders. So remember, China is the biggest exporter in the world. That new orders edged down to 47.6, a contraction from 50.4. So what I want you to understand is from a new orders perspective, the economy in China was racing up. It flatlines and it pulls back. That is a dangerous sign now telling us that the stagflation issue is going to be a worldwide issue, not just a U.S. or Chinese issue. Let's take a look at South Korea exports here as they're suffering the longest losing streak in three years. And this is just adding to the story because look Look at this china sales are tumbling but one thing that shouldn't be tumbling is your portfolio because if you had the cta timer pro report that's currently 30 bucks we're looking at raising the price soon you would know how the machines are positioned and there's something in today's report that is a gold mine opportunity because when you understand how to use it because of its historical overlay if you see some minus 100s it's telling you something is deeply oversold on a long-term basis on a historic model if you're looking for a long opportunity, that's where you should be at. You look for a short side, you look for 100 on the plus side on both. We're gonna put a note out to the subscribers to show them this opportunity. You can jump in on that. It's 30 bucks while supplies last. 30 day money back guarantee. Here, South Korea's exports fell for a seventh straight month in April for their longest losing streak in three years, driven by an extended slump and get this sales to China. So, you know, we talk about this boom in China that's supposed to be happening and South Korea is a major export in China. And all of a sudden they're seeing exports to China slump tells us there is something seriously wrong in the Chinese economy that's not showing up in their data. Of course, we know the government likes to manipulate their data there. So this doesn't come as a surprise because South Korea is not manipulating anything here. Overseas sales by Asia's fourth largest economy is the South Korea fell 14.2% year over year. That is a huge double digit year over year decline. And that is terrible. It's the worst decline in three months. It was staggering and reinforced by the recent signs of a domestic economy struggling to fire on all cylinders in the wake of a slowing global growth. I'm not gonna say it's domestic economy struggling. I'm saying it's global economy struggling. And we start to see this happening in the major exporters and and then it all spirals down with a lag to the major importers, such as the U.S. A breakdown of the data showed exports to China tumbled 26.5% for their 11th consecutive month of declines, while those in the United States fell 4.4%, the first ranking in a month in three, and shipments to the EU rose a whopping 9.5%.
9.9%. So EU looking a little bit better than everyone else here. Imports into South Korea fell in April fell 13.3%, following a 6.4% decline in March. So again, we're seeing faster declines on the import and export. That is a major indication of a slowing global economy. It starts to validate the stagflationary thesis here, because when you see slowing global growth, you need fewer employees, but what you also need is inflation to come down. So far, no signs of that at all, but one thing that could come crashing down, I know many of you are big bulls on gold. You would love to see the dollar come crashing down. Well, check this out. We're gonna make the case of why stagflation could send the dollar tumbling. As hedge funds bet dollar to erase hike cycle gains as the Fed peaks, hedge funds and other large speculators boosted their net bearish position on the greenback against major peers to more than 70,000 contracts. Now, just keep in mind, hedge funds aren't always on the right side of a major move. Sometimes they're just hedging their positions. But look at this chart from Bloomberg, which shows the speculative net positioning. So here you see hedge funds when they're long are these uh, vertical lines above the zero bar when they're bearish paying on the weaker dollar here you see those vertical lines to the downside and you can look here around 2020 the hedge funds got bearish on the dollar and that black line there is a the dollar it drove it down they did it again here kind of in 2021 and now look at this 2023 they're starting to build their bearish bets on a weaker dollar and can we make the case that the dollar is heading lower well i think we actually can the Fed is seen almost certain to hike its rate by a quarter point this week, but the swaps traders are pricing in for whole policy before turning toward lower the benchmark by year's end. Well, there's one thing I will disagree is that statement. Here we have the federal fund rate in red and the inverted 10-year, two 2-year two yield curve, that in blue, what the curve is saying as the curve now starts to steepen, which is shown inverted, so rolling over, you see as it rolls over and steepens, again, that means the Fed's gonna cut. But what does that mean for the greenback? You're saying, well, let's look at these current new orders. Let's go back to the Philly Fed. You know, we love them because we've got tons of data here in the Fed database, and we'll overlay the nominal broad US dollar index because what I want you to understand as demand for dollars goes down, which would end indicate that global trade is slowing, so people don't need as many dollars. What we should see is the dollar fall. The question is, do we see that throughout history? The answer is yes. Here you can see going into the global financial crisis, we see new orders continue to fall. That would also mean backlog of orders were falling. Notably, look, you could see the nominal broad US dollar index heading down before, of course, the crisis hit and there was a flight to safety. Now, what do we see again? New orders declining here and the dollar is now slowly weakening, which kind of suggests that, of course, these hedge funds are looking at a bearish bet and may be on the right side of the trade. Even going back to 2015 and 2016, you see new orders kind of slow down then they flatline and then what happens the dollar flatlines and then starts to roll over so we're seeing a lot of signs here that make sense that the dollar could further weaken again i know many of you are super bullish on gold or love to hear that news but something that's got a bit of a conundrum did the U.S. government show uh, throw J.P. Morgan a gift this is one thing i'd love to know what you think about let's check this out as J.P. Morgan is First Republic's turmoil after FDIC seizure. Now, we've been reporting on this and noting that, of course, the, uh, the FDIC put out bids for the banks to take over, of course, First Republic. What we didn't know is there was going to be a relationship where the government was going to share potentially not only the profits, but the losses. For the $173 billion in loans and $30 billion in securities included in the deal, J.P. Morgan and the FDIC signed the loss-sharing agreement to cover single-family residential mortgage loans and commercial loans, as well as $50 billion worth of five-year fixed-rate term financing. The FDIC and J.P. Morgan will share in both the losses and the potential recovery on these loans, with the agency knowing it should maximize recoveries on the assets by keeping them in the private sector. The FDIC C estimated that the cost of the deposit insurance fund will be a whopping $13 billion. Do you think JP Morgan needed this? Do you think the government should share in it? I mean, after all, they sold the bank to JP Morgan, who we know has a ton of money, and now the government is in a potential loss sharing scenario. We'll hope that somehow, some way, that the FDIC will come out ahead on this. But for the moment, a $13 billion hit, I'm going to about you. I don't think that's right. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.